scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not, does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Where, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sophie. And good morning and welcome again to Redeemer Lincoln Square. We've been looking at various cultural narratives this fall. And we've been doing this because unknowingly we've absorbed these narratives as true, as they're just part of the fabric of our culture. And they've now functioned as our culture's belief system. And so what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to compare and contrast the various cultural narratives with the biblical narrative to see which one makes sense of our experience the best, which one explains reality the best. And so what we've done over the past couple of weeks is we've looked at narratives like identity, uh, sex, intimacy, happiness, freedom, justice, and power. And we've been doing this, and what we've seen is that these narratives are proposed to us in culture as ways for us to be fulfilled, ways for us to Uh, be sustained, uh, to have meaning and purpose. And yet, week after week, we've shown you how they have not. And we've addressed the how, but you know what we haven't done yet? We haven't addressed the overarching why, why they do not work. And so what I want to do today is in the most misunderstood uh, biblical passage, potentially, in the Bible, and also the climax of Paul's letter to the Corinthians in, in this first letter, He tells us the why. So let's look at this passage in three parts. Why the narratives don't work. What then really will work. What will help us change. And then lastly, how do we live it out? So why don't the narratives work? What will bring change? And then how do we live it out? So first, why don't our culture's narratives work to fulfill, sustain, and complete us? Well, today's text, if you look at it, this tends to be read mostly at weddings. This tends to be one of the most uh, under, well, it's one of the most well-known and famous passages by Paul. And yet, Paul isn't saying love is patient, love is kind abstractly. He's talking, this is happening 13 chapters into a long letter where 12 chapters have just gone by where Paul has addressed people who are incredibly gifted, incredibly talented, and yet they're still a mess. And so in this text, he, he's, he's talked for 12 chapters about what's been wrong. So he, here he now goes through what he, they do do well. So he starts giving them the gifts that they have said that they have, that, that are evident in their community. So number one, look at verse one. He says, if you speak in tongues of men, if you have faith that uh, can move mountains, right? There, there's a spiritual, supernatural gift there. Verse two If you can fathom all mysteries, if you can prophesy, if you can have all knowledge, knowledge is intellect, right? There's intellectual gifting here. Go to verse 3. If I give all that I possess to the poor, there's a sacrificial gifting here. 
So if you zoom out, you have spiritual, supernatural, intellectual, sacrificial gifting, all happening in a thriving, growing community. You know, this is what the dream team's about. This is what, you know, churches all want to have this. And so Paul should be like, hey, this is great, right? No, he doesn't. See, the first word in our passage, notice it says, if. If you have these things, and if these are evident in your life, and they were in the, the group of, of the Corinthians here, and yet for 12 chapters, Paul's detailed how they've been spiteful and cold and mean and harsh and vindictive and rude and filled with pride. He's saying, if you have all these things, if that's still evident, then it's still nothing. That there's still not, you're still at the end of the day rude and mean and petty. It's, you're a resounding gong. You're nothing. Likewise, our culture, what do we do? We spend so much time and effort desiring freedom, going after happiness, trying to get an identity. We, we put a lot of time and effort into these things, and we have to ask ourselves at the end of the day, is our culture, are you individually, are we, are we less vindictive? Are, are we less prideful? Are we, are we more prone to kindness and love and care and all these things? Is that, do we see that? And what we've tried to do over the weeks, we try to look and, and say, is that what's happening in our culture? And the studies show and, and your uh, own experiences show that that's not happening. That we're more fragmented, we're more inhumane, we're, we're less accepting, we're less warm. We're just like the Corinthians, we're, more, we're, we're still vindictive and petty and rude and prideful. Some of you might say, well, at least we, we now have more, you know, we, people can get their own identity. We can choose your own identity, Right? Again, the, the, what we see is that people today are less secure in their identity than ever before. Well, people are at least happier, right? They're happier. Well, we showed weeks ago the studies, as we ask, every year we're actually getting less happy. And so what we're finding here is actually the Corinthians, they misidentified gifts and abilities to sustain themselves for their purpose and identity. And we've misidentified our cultural narratives because in both cases— the real problem has not actually been addressed. The real problem hasn't been identified. We haven't gone deep enough. I believe every culture tries to answer for the people in that culture the questions of life, the big questions of why am I here and what's the point of everything. Traditional cultures try to say it's the family, it's honor, it's, it's the, the virtues inherent that we need to develop. Our secular culture says no, the problem is that individuals don't have the power to seek their identity and happiness and freedom and, and power and justice. And we have to ask ourselves, are these answers that culture has given us, are they working? Do they actually address the real problem? Years ago, after World War II, after, you know, I, I was a history major in college, after uh, there was an incredible change of technological advancement, there was an incredible change of of education in the Western world. And yet what ended up happening is, is the 20th century was we killed more people, we, humans killed more of each other in the 20th century than all the other centuries combined. And it led to people asking right after World War II, well, what's wrong with us? And so the London Times asked some of the writers in the, of that day and age to write essays on what's wrong with this world. British Catholic G.K. Chesterton wrote into the paper two words. I am, signed G.K. Chesterton. I think what Paul is trying to say to us is no one's gone deep enough. Unless something comes into your heart, unless something changes your very nature in the way of operation, the way we normally go about our everyday lives, it doesn't matter how many gifts you have, it doesn't matter how many cultural narratives you feel like you're fulfilling, it doesn't matter... If you have these things, if you're still self-centered, you're still self-absorbed, you're still self-focused, you're going to be worse for it, and the people around you are going to be worse for it, and the whole world will be as well. And that's what we're finding. And so before we move on, I, I want to ask you this. What cultural narratives have you been chasing after that are not, that's not actually working for your life? See, the problem with cultural narratives is, is that actually there, there's all, there are half-truths. They, they they're not all wrong. They actually have some real value in them, but they don't fulfill. So which ones are you chasing after? Which ones are you thinking are going to be enough and they're not? Is it the do, what's feel, is it the do what feels right narrative? Is it follow your heart as long as it doesn't harm other people? Is it uh, sex and intimacy? 
with our bodies, but then it turns into usury and consumption. Are, have you been sufficiently, I guess this is the question I want to ask you, have you been sufficiently inoculated from the narratives of this world, protected from the fact that they don't work? Have you done that work? Have you thought about that? Number one. Okay. Number two. Fine. Then what will work? What will change? You might think that Paul's answer in this text is, and my answer is, you need to get religious. Right? A lot of people think that that's what pastors do, right? They get up here and they say, oh, the evils of the cultural narratives. Psst, you know, bad. Let's get religion. Let's love Jesus, right? Is that, is that what Paul's saying? Is that what I'm saying? A lot of people think that's what Christianity is. Christianity is just like all other religions. You know, try hard, be good, follow the rules, do these practices, get these traditions in your life. And then you'll get this, the supernatural experiences. Then you'll get these gifts. Then you'll have all these things in your life. And you know, I, I love this passage because Paul is saying, actually, you can have extraordinary impressions on the mind. You can have supernatural gifts. You can be someone who knows all the mysteries of knowledge, which is a pretty powerful thought if you think about it, and yet he's saying that's still not evidence that you have real love and real grace in your life. That should be halting to you. That should, be, that should like tell you something's different here. Because Paul's saying you can think you're Christian. The Corinthians thought they're Christians. They served on Sunday. They loved people. They tried to care for people. They, in, at least in what they thought it was love and care. And yet, they still were nothing. They gave their money away to the poor. They gave their money to the church. And Paul says it's still nothing at the end of the day. You can have real supernatural gifts. You can have real abilities. You can look it, to the world. It can look like you're the perfect version of who you are and what everybody wants you to be. And it matters not. Having the gifts of God and not the love of God matters not. Judas, one of the 12 disciples, one of the closest people to Jesus, what did he do? He had miracles. He did supernatural things. He, he knew, he had personal relationship with Jesus and it wasn't enough. He's saying, well then, what, help do, what, what hope do we have actually? Because Paul is saying, that's still then a resounding gong at the end of the day. Your religious gifts are not going to be enough. So here's what, you know, pull back for a second. Finding your identity, you can be self-absorbed in that, but you can be just as self-absorbed in your religious gifts. Having the gifts of God and not the love of God matters not. Um, you can have a misplaced sense of self and self-focus religiously and non-religiously. Why? Because you can be just as self-centered in being religious as, it, as, as, just, as much as being non-religious. You can be just as self-absorbed in your prophesying as much as finding your identity, finding your happiness, finding your freedom. You can be just as self-focused. Here's, here's a little scary thought. You can come here on Sundays, you can, you can be praising God, but if there's a part of you in your life that goes, yeah, I feel pretty good that I'm the kind of person who praises God, who goes to church on Sundays, what's happening there? That's not about God, that's about you now. That's self-focus, that's still self-centeredness. Gifts over grace is always wrong. The number one problem with the Corinthians, and the number one problem that you and I have, is that it's not the bad things that, we, that the world says is wrong. It's usually using our goodness as grace. And that's what won't change us. Fine, then what does? What changes us, Paul says, is love. And I really, by the way, I cringe when I say that phrase, because I know the minute I say it's love, you take your modern sense of what you think love is, and you start putting it in here. I'm really worried that Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it, is in the back of your mind. I'm worried that you think love is just the butterflies of, of, of attraction that you feel, that, that it's something that you can fall in and out of like a vat. Those are modern senses. That's actually not here in the text. In the text, what does it say love is? When Paul says love is not self-seeking, what he's trying to get at is, if the problem of the world isn't just you don't have enough narratives, isn't that you don't have enough gifts, but the problem, the real problem, is self-centeredness and self-focus and self-absorption, he's saying the only answer is biblical love that is focused and centered not on self. When you're self-absorbed, here's what you're saying. At the end of the day, you're saying this, my needs over your needs. Biblical love says your needs over my needs. 
when you say, I'm patient, what you're saying in that phrase is you're saying, I, your needs are more important than my needs. That's why you can have a morally restrained heart, but not a supernaturally changed heart. And the only way you can tell the difference is this. Real love says, my life for you, not your life for me. Real love says, thee, not me, at the end of the day. And so, go back to our text here. Have you ever tried to do any of these things? Have you ever tried to lovingly be patient? It's really difficult to be lovingly patient when the, everything the other person does makes you want to burst out in anger, make you, your top fly off. It's very hard to be not envy. Love is, it says love does not envy. Have you ever tried to do that? It's really hard not to envy when you see what they have that you should have too, and it's not fair. I want that. It's not fair I don't have that. I should have that too. How do you do these things, right? Have you ever tried to love never fails? Have you ever tried love always trusts? Always trusts. That's why I actually find it a little fascinating that once we realize Paul is describing something that's almost impossible to do, I don't know if it's the best thing to do to read this right at a wedding in front of people before their marriage. Like, it's, this, is, this is not a kind thing to do, to do that. But that's what will change us. It's, it's this transformational biblical love. So, third point. If only a supernaturally changed heart that really loves is the answer, then how do we live this out? How do we get this in our life? I think it's buried. The answer is buried in, in the description that Paul uses about love. Because notice, when he's detailing the traits of love, he doesn't say this. He doesn't say that love is made up of kindness. He doesn't say love contains hope. But that's what you would think he would say if he's just trying to describe love. Instead, what does he do? He says love is. And by doing that, by saying love is, he's personifying love. Notice it says love is not easily angered. That's personification. Love does not dishonor others. Right. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love delights in that love does not delight in evil. See, what's he doing? He's making love a person, and I think he's doing it for two reasons. Reason number one is this. It's what your heart needs at the end of the day. Why? Um, comedian Jerry Seinfeld a couple years ago did a, uh, a stand-up routine about phones, cell phones. And he, he starts his bit by saying, hey, everybody loves cell phones because it's a way to feel safe, right? We can, we can always pull it out. We can be in contact with our loved ones. But then he said, but let's be honest. As you look at your contact list, all your loved ones, how much is it that you really care about them? Like, most people use phones like a, a French king where you swipe like, who shall I listen to today? You know, who should I ignore today? You know, who, who shall I favor? Who should I, I choose to respond to today? I think not. No, I will not do that. that, that you know, you know uh, whom shall I ignore? Whom, who shall I actually bless with my presence? And his point is this. We tend to use technology for ourselves, right? It's always about me. It's, a, it's about curating an image to the world. It's a control and have things just like we have it, right? Technology companies love to talk about the customization for you, right? It's playing on our own self-centeredness in that sense. But I want to go deeper. Why? Why do we feel like we have to do this? Right? No judgment here. Why are we self-focused? I think at the end of the day, if I'm honest with myself, it's I say to my, it's because if I don't focus on myself, who will? Right? At the end of the day, we, we, if I don't advocate for myself, who's going to actually advocate for me? And if that's true, then the only way out of self-centeredness, the only way that you're going to be able to get out of self-focus is if you feel like you don't have to advocate or center yourself anymore, which means the only way out is to experience somebody who places your needs over their needs. The only way out is somebody who says, not your life for me, Michael. It's, no, I'm going to give my life for you. And yet we still have to ask ourselves, well, then where are we going to get a love that's this patient? Where are we going to get a love that keeps no record of wrongs, that never fails? Right? Parents, what do they do? Parents fail. Spouses fail. Money fails. Your job's going to fail. Everything fails eventually. The cultural narratives of freedom, identity, intimacy, 
um, happiness, they, we've all shown you how they fail. So where do we get somebody who will say, your needs over mine, even though they look depth, into the depths of our heart, and doesn't just see part of who you are, but sees all of who you are. Where are you going to get that? Paul says in our text, he says, you've already met that person. You've already met him. How? Because Jesus was patient on that cross. The word patience in, this, in our text, it's the Greek word um, macrothemia. Macro, right? M- uh, great. Themia, suffering. Great suffering, long suffering. Jesus was long suffering. How? In the Garden of Gethsemane when he says, Lord, let this cup pass. Not my will, but your will be done. And then he takes it anyway. He patiently took and accepted it. Jesus says, it says here that he has no record of wrongs. Love has no record of wrongs. Why? Because the debt is already paid. The debt's already paid. He can't ask for payment again. I was having a hard time um, falling asleep a couple weeks ago. And I ended up reading Psalm 139 where it talks about, you know me, right? You hem me in. You, uh, you, you, you're all around me. And particularly when we feel like the Lord is, is distant, Psalm 139 says, no, in fact, he, he is present. And it says many times in the Old Testament that he remembers our sins no more, which is actually what we see right here. He remembers our sin no more. And I was thinking about it, that, you know, in the middle of the night, wait. If God remembers our sins no more, and yet God knows everything, well, how's that possible? It must mean that he must be actively forgetting. Which means if there's things right now that you can't forgive yourself of, he already has. If there's things right now that you can't let yourself off because you st- still beat yourself up on, this is saying that he, he, he's already forgotten those things. They've been taken away. That's cause that, why? Because that's what love is. And he's applying it to you. Don't you see, Jesus is the personification of every single one of these attributes. Why? Because it's what your heart ultimately needs to get out of self-centeredness, to get out of that self-focus. That you can't get this love from anyone or anything else. Why? Because everyone and anyone else eventually ends. Jesus, his love bursts forth more when he dies. That's why I I love the thief on the cross, right? The thief on the cross, guess what? He never went to church, never went to a Bible study, has no idea how to develop his gifts. He has no idea what his talents really will be. And yet Jesus says one little phrase to him. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that's enough to change his life because Jesus whispered those words to him. What words of love has Jesus whispered to you and are you listening to them? Right? What, what, his heart for you, how much has that actually changed your heart? Have you listened to those things? Because he's the definition of my life for you. And it's the only way to be able to change ourselves from self-focus. Because that, that's the answer to our problems, to accept his love. And so, that's the first reason he personifies love. Now the second reason Paul makes love a person is this. Because at the end of the day, you're never going to love unless you feel loved. I can prove that. One of my friends, um, I met him in Queens uh, years ago. And um, he actually was born and raised in a very diff- foreign country, very different country. He was born in, a, in an orphanage. And in this country and in that um, orphanage, the practice was to never hold babies. So he was never held. They, they had, he, had him, he was in a bassinet. They fed him in a bassinet. They, they changed his diaper in a bassinet, never... Was, was touched. And today, he, um, he has hardships when it comes to connecting with people. He has hardships. He has sensory issues as well. And the reason why is because literally you need to, and the studies show this, to, to a love, you have to experience love. You can't learn that in a book. You can't just be told about it. It actually has to be experienced. If you've been loved little, you love little. If you've been loved a lot, you love a lot. And so, if you felt and had the limitless love of Christ in your life, if you experienced that, you'll be very surprised about your ability to love. So how do you know if you've actually had this experience in your life? Well, I'll tell you what, what it isn't. If you're more concerned about getting gifts than getting his love, you haven't tasted his love. If you're more concerned about being right than being loving, 
You, don't, you haven't tasted his love. If you're more concerned about fairness than generosity, you haven't gotten his love. If you're more concerned about for yourself, about am I in the kingdom, than wondering if others are in the kingdom, you haven't experienced his love. And I know this because this is where the rest of the text, verses 8 through 13, is so helpful. That look, look, If you look down here, it says, Paul says... And what you need is to know that what's coming in part, what, what, sorry, what, what we know only in part, one day is going to be completed. We're going to know in fullness. Go down to verse 12, and it says, For now we see only a reflection, but then one day we're going to see face to face. See face to face what? That, world, that, that heaven is a world of love. That in the Trinity you have perfect self-giving and mutual care. And if that's the reality, if that's the basis of the universe, then the basis of heaven is going to be that world of love. Two nights ago, I had one of the most vivid dreams I've ever had. Uh, today, um, my dad passed away exactly six months from today, six months ago. And in this dream, he was alive. And um, it, it, the story is actually kind of a f weird story, that apparently the hospital had kept his body and slowly it was repairing itself and uh, they didn't want to tell us because they didn't want to get our hopes up. But now he was alive, and I was talking to him. I was like, hey, why, you know, where have you been? I haven't seen you around. We're, we're, it, it was a little awkward, but, um, <laughs> but, he, was, but he was alive in, in the dream. And yet, in the middle of, in, real, in reality, in the middle of the night, there, I had a, um, a picture that leans up against uh, my wall on my desk. And it fell over, and, and, and um, the glass shattered, and I woke up. And I was, it was okay because I was happy that my dad was alive. And so I leaned over to get my phone. And, and, and yet in a couple seconds, I realized that he was still dead. My dad used to tell a story about when he had a nightmare. And he thought his whole family had died. And then he woke up. And they were still alive. And he was so overjoyed. And the, and the, the nightmare made him love his family better. It's a little weird because in my version, it's the other way around. I thought he was alive, and then I woke up, and he was still dead. I don't know right now if you're living right now a nightmare that one day you'll wake up and realize it was a dream, or maybe you're living dreams that you realize are actually nightmares. But either way, the answer, the solution for us is that heaven is going to be a world of love, that we're going to see that face-to-face. -face. When we come face-to-face -face with him, it means that Everything true is going to become real, and everything untrue, everything sad will become untrue. And so go back to my father. The answer to my, to my dream, where I woke and I'm still in sadness, and the answer to my father's dream, where he woke and he was in happiness, it's this, that the world of love is to come. That you're going to be able to handle the suffering and the sadness because every bad thing will be just like a nightmare that you're going to wake up one day. And everything real, everything true will become real, and everything sad will become untrue. That's because we know that heaven is a world of love, and it's coming, and yet at the same time we can look at the past, and we can see the cross, and we can see the resurrection, and we can say that's already been secured for us. So today, we can live out love in the here and now. And so to end, here's what I want to end. If you want to be a mom who's able to wake up 15 times in the middle of the night because a child has a nightmare and you don't want to respond in anger. If you want to be a manager who is able to take a pay cut so others can stay employed. If you want to be that roommate, if you want to be that friend and mother or father or son or daughter and still be able to love biblically, which means to seek a, a restorative presence for those around us. Let me try to end with just a couple practical considerations. Let me give you three quick ones. Number one is don't let your heart go after the things that aren't going to satisfy. Those cultural narratives, there's some validity in them, but they're not enough to sustain you. I don't care how good the goodnesses are in the world, they're not going to be good enough. They pale in comparison to his love for you. Seek his love. Don't seek the loves of the world. Not to say they're not good, not to say you don't enter in them, not to say you don't actually get them, but seek his love first, which is number two. If you don't let your heart go after these things, instead seek 
And here's what you'll find. You'll find his love most and sometimes in the darkest, strangest places of your life. It'll be at the bottom of the sea of hurt, and he's there. It'll be uh, where you feel most lost. It'll be when you feel most sad. It'll be, it'll be, you will see it in his love, even when you used to have a love that's gone that you wish was back, when you wish that he was still here. In that space where you miss the most, where you wish him back the most, he's offering you a stronger love in him. One Puritan pastor put it this way, turn your, your stream of thoughts towards the world of love and towards the God who is the one who dwells there. As you let your thoughts dwell in delight on his love for you, here's what you're going to realize. The love that you miss, the love that you wish you had back, was always, always, always pointing you to the love that he had for you. It always was. You might not have known it, but you can know it more in that moment. I've been finding myself, hopefully I'm not becoming sentimental, but I'm finding myself going back and watching, uh, reviewing pictures, not just of my family, but just of my experiences. And I think that the reason why I do is because when I see those things, it, it brings joy. As I seek and remember it brings joy, and I want you folks, I want you to be able to do the same thing. Go back into the spaces where the Lord has met you. If you're like, I, I can't think of those things, go to place, look at your current life, and maybe he's meeting you right there. Seek and remember his love for you. And last point, to love, to impact those closest around us. Ultimately, you're going to do that by being curious. I just found this out. Did you know that Jesus in the recorded life that we had of him, did you know that he asked over 300 questions? People asked him 187, and he only answered three. But he asked, I know, that's telling you something there. But he asked 300 questions. Questions like, what do you think? What do you say? What do you like? He was the most curious person in the world, and yet he, knew, he already knew everything already. So why would he do it? He did it because he knew that's the way that you enter into other people's lives. And so it, I believe that my life for you, the definition of love, which Jesus is, it will look like curiosity to the world. You'll be curious of yourself. You'll be curious of other people. And that'll leave you, that'll let you enter into the other individuals. So when we care enough to ask people about them, when we care enough to ask folks, which is why Graham earlier talked about how we're going to have a church-wide Christmas party on December 6th, we can ask people to that. We can ask people to lessons and carols in, on December 10th. It's very, you know, singing carols, reading some scripture, it's, it's an easy ask. But who are the people around us that we can? Will we ha- take the time and the effort? It does take time and effort to think about and, a- and have curious lives enough with people to do that. It takes being intentional to have this bringer mentality. That's why we're going to do a Q&R right after the service. It's for everybody, children, adults, and we're going to try to discuss, like, what does this look like to be like this? If Jesus is just an example to you, he'll crush you. But if Jesus is the bringer of love to your life, that's going to change you. It's going to bring so much love into your life that the biggest thing you're going to want is you're going to want other people to have that love in their life too. And will we have that? Will that happen to us? Bring folks to our Christmas party. Bring them to the lesson. Bring them to your homes. Hospitality. We can do that as we're curious, as we live out this love. Don't seek the things that won't fulfill. Seek him to lead these curious lives in love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I don't know where everybody else is in this room, what spaces of hurt and and, and hardship. Father, whether we're having the dream life or the nightmare life, I pray that we'll see that Only in you, Father, will all things sad will become untrue, and all true things that might have been taken from us will become real again. That's the hope we have. There's no other hope. The world doesn't have that hope. Other religions have disembodied lives. There is a physical, tangible reality that's coming into fruition. And the resurrection is the proof positive of that, and yet often we don't live it. Often we forget about it. It doesn't inform our lives. I pray it does. 
Wherever people are in this room, Father, I pray that your spirit moves into their life to reveal this love in a more profound way. Real love. Biblical love. Your commitment. Your care. The application of of truth and grace. Father, I pray that we seek grace over gifts. Help us to see that all, all the gifts and talents in the world mean nothing without your gifts without your grace and love. Move in our hearts. We pray these things in your name. Amen.